Grab some coffee, a Mountain Dew, maybe both. A storm is brewing, the Brainstorm. Welcome to the Brainstorm with Matt and Mike. Hey, welcome to the Brainstorm with Matt and Mike. Another week has come and uh, is quickly going, even though on a radio it's a Monday morning and uh, our podcasts and our YouTube and our videos from our uh, social media all get released this afternoon from this morning's show if you're listening to us on the radio. Uh, we're excited about today's show. Uh, Mike and I have been talking about uh, the need for just IT infrastructure, information technology infrastructure, and cybersecurity. We, we meet so many business owners and business executives, Mike, that talk about that and really just have no clue what's going on. I think you and I are somewhat in that ball game, in that ballpark, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, there's, there's two things that we know confuse business owners more than anything, Matt, and that is marketing and technology. And technology. I mean, it, it changes so rapidly, both of those realms, that it's just hard to keep up. And it's become a, a very diverse, um, multiple threaded, you know, industry for both. And interestingly enough, they connect a lot. I agree. I agree completely with you. And, and, and it's also just frustrating for business owners, which is the reason why we've asked our friends and, and colleagues in the information world to come on our show today. We're excited to have Kevin Wade and Peter Franklin. Uh, Kevin's the founder and CEO of IntelliSystems, uh, and Peter Franklin's the sales manager. Guys, we really appreciate you coming on our show today and being our guest to inform us, educate us, and educate our listeners and our viewers. Thank you very much for coming on our show. Well, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. We look forward to the show. But before we kind of deep dive into the into this world of the unknown, if you will, uh, you guys know it. Thankfully, we have somebody that's educated <laughs> at the table talking about this. But in the in the kind of the, the world of the unknown, especially cybersecurity, information technology as well, help us understand who IntelliSystems is. Well, and I will tell you, I'm not the engineer. I tell people that straight up. So I'm not going to tell you the nuts and bolts of how to do these things. But what I think I can do is help uh, other uh, business owners like myself understand some of this in, in English. And I've been I told think that's the only way to do it, Kevin, because I mean, <laughs> again, Mike and I own this business and, in, in, you know, we're, we're in marketing and advertising and people yeah. just automatically assume that that we do the same thing. And we need, like, we have people that, that help us understand what we're doing over on our end. So we yeah. don't do the same thing. So a little background. Uh, we've been in business 27 years, actually. I started the business on my dining room table. And uh, when I started out, I was it. And uh, so I'd roll out of bed in the morning, do some accounting, uh, <laughs> You know, at some point, get out on the street and try to sell some things, or or go and do a repair work, um, and then you know, towards the end of the day, get back in, and that was when I generated invoices and more accounting work. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and that was my day for for about a year and a half, and brought on some more technical uh, partners at some point in 1995, and. Um, we moved out of my house. Uh, <laughs> well, that was a good, that was a good move. Uh, we pretty much had to. Yeah. It was three of us then. So, um, but we've we've we started out then more, uh, and we've always had the focus of the service aspect of what we do. It's not about selling lots of heavy metal. It's about the service aspect and and helping customers get the most out of the equipment they buy. Mm. Uh, we've reinvented ourselves two or three times along the way, uh, where we. M eventually modified our business plan so that we're where we are today, which is we're, we act as, uh, for most of our customers, we act as their IT department. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like off-site, scalable, yep. so, IT service department. Of course, we meet with them proactively and uh, we ha even have, I think that's what's unique about us. We have a unique approach to um, working with our clients in that we have people that have specialized hats. And I think you've mentioned this oftentimes, Peter. Um, people have specialized hats in our in our business, in our company. So we have people that act as a virtual chief information officer, okay. uh, someone that can work with a client, uh, help them plan, help them make the right best practice decisions. Right. Um, 
and even compare notes along the way to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. That whatever, makes sense. Whatever it is. Yeah. Um, we have, of course, people that are specialists in keeping customers safe. So making sure that the bad internet doesn't get in. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a stack of software and hardware tools that we use in order to try mm -hmm. to keep customer systems clean. Okay. Um, and, and then we have people that the best thing that the best, most important thing they do is they take your phone call and they're the right. ones that can remote in and they can help you with your problems. And we have people that do projects that come out and they can replace a server, install a new Wi-Fi, uh, some new Wi-Fi yeah. gear. Um, well, just a ton, a just, plethora of different types yeah. of VoIP folks, phones, specialists. cabling, right. all kinds of different right. yeah. specialties. So yeah. I think that's somewhat unique because a lot of times what we run across as competitors are and nothing wrong with this because I was one one day too. Mm -hmm. But you know, the one or two person office, and the, the, unfortunately, they've got to wear a bunch of hats. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the chances of them really being as good as the specialists that we have uh, is kind of slim. Yeah. That they can do all those things. Um, you, know, you know, Kevin, something you just said, you said wearing multiple hats. And yes. so every business owner, um, even business leaders, maybe they are not the, the founder or the CEO, but they are in a leadership role. Uh, they understand, especially in the small business side, what it looks like to wear a lot of different hats. Yes. And what we see oftentimes with our clients uh, is oftentimes they may have one IT person on staff, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, or no one on staff. And there's someone who's trying to fill the gap who also serves in a different role. And they really just happen to be the person that they think happens to be the most technically savvy. So it's the person who bought the latest iPhone each time or the person who bought the iPad, you know, and, Pro and, when it first came out. And we run into that a lot where we, we go in and we start working with a client and they have a person that just, they're kind of, they're better than everyone else at computers. Right. And so they get that hat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we honestly probably run into that more often than not. Yeah, right, that right. there's someone in the office that's pretty good, but doesn't know anything on the maybe the cybersecurity end of things, but they're very good with the technical abilities. So they become the, the IT computer. department. They, they know their software. They assume it. Right. Right. They, yeah. know their, right. they know their yeah. specific applications. Right. Right. Yeah, they right. don't necessarily really know it. Right. They know just enough to keep things limping along. I can put a right. Band-Aid on and it. So, so what I'd like to do is, can we talk about what the potential repercussions of someone not investing in having their IT systems uh, managed <laughs> by a professional group like yours? I mean, what's, what's at risk? Well, besides the obvious, I mean, the, the occurrence of, of ransomware, for instance, mm -hmm. is something that is happening more and more often. And the risk is that, one, you can have people that can't work on their computer. Okay? Right. That's, that seems simple enough. But then what if that computer is how you generate your livelihood? So mm -hmm. maybe it's an accounting workstation. and. You've got three monitors because you've got three three software products you're running at the same time, and you're trying to get this work done, yeah. and you're not able to do it. Times X number of employees. Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty easy to understand. Uh, we often find though that there are some other things that are going on in a business that are hidden. Maybe it's just simply the ability to print and create documents that need to be signed by customers. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's uh, you may have Internet of Things type gadgets around the building, like the thermostat for mm -hmm. the HVAC system. Um, lots of other places where technology pops up. You may be, maybe in your place here even, you have a guest Wi-Fi network mm. where yep. somebody comes to visit, they expect to be able to get Internet you know, in this brick building here, not much gets in from outside. So right. they would pretty much need to be able to get Wi-Fi access. And if that guest network is down, it, it suffers with the experience you give your customers, mm -hmm. for instance, when you come in, when they come in. And that that's really where we're, you know, it's, it's the obvious, okay, the accountant can't work. But then the less obvious of what happens to an experience maybe when customers come in. You have CNN on the TV screens when you walk in, for instance, and everything's down because all the streaming doesn't work. Right. Or, you know, similar yeah. types of things. Hey, Kevin, you said something a little while ago about you've kind of reinvented yourself I, I'm with 
the fast paced world of technology that you guys live in, you probably are having to kind of revisit the business model quite often as far as new offerings and, and how you service the, the clients and so on and so forth. But why uh, IntelliSystems? Was that a name that you originally started with or is that something that has rebranded since uh, since you first started? Is that the name you originally came up with or, or where did you come up with that? It is. Yeah, we started with that what, name. What was your thought process around that name? Um, you know, I, I guess it was pretty simple. It was a kind of a contraction with intelligent and okay. systems. Okay. And uh, uh, that's probably the extent of it yeah no, I love no, no real no real yeah because you know i didn't <laughs> no know i didn't know if that's what anything. it was or, or or it had something to do with the difference between cybersecurity and was cybersecurity? uh i mean what was the first thing was it information technology in the early days and then it kind of started morphing into data protection and then it, it was then, we we really did more in the way of break fix and, yeah to start off with uh, you know customer says i need to get uh, i need to be able to do this on my computer what do you recommend? Mm -hmm. So it generally was very workstation centered. Uh, we eventually got into more networking and uh, early on we did, uh, we've always done the cabling and created the infrastructure. We've gotten better at it over the years, obviously. Yeah. We're licensed and insured to do that now. They actually have a department that they are, are actual contractors and that's what they That's on. all they do yeah. every day is go out and install cabling and Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. infrastructure but it's it's migrated you know in the in the late 90s into 2000s we started seeing more and more companies adopt a true firewall mm -hmm. you started more protection see, yeah we've seen antivirus for many years yeah um what we've found really in the last 10 12 years is firewall and antivirus is really not enough uh, antivirus is probably 63 percent effective and of course 62 percent of all statistics are made up i think 63 <laughs> percent 63 percent of antivirus yeah. is typically the best effectiveness you get out of that and a firewall is effective at sharing internet you know within the office and creating somewhat of a a space between you and the internet but really a firewall these days is kind of like a screen door on the interstate yeah you know? <laughs> uh, it you can keep most honest things out, but if somebody really wants in, they just bust a hole in the screen yeah, door and okay, open that the latch. Makes, that makes sense. So we had to obviously these days we have to obviously do more than that, and um, so we've got a variety of stacks of software that keep things from happening based on user mm -hmm. errors and also even um, outside. Uh, in, in people that may would try to get in forced entry from the outside tries to keep them out so we do some preventive things that do that but what we really have found in the last few years is the thing that causes the most problems are spam and phishing mm. uh, phishing emails and so and even now texts and voicemails yeah, that's true yeah and so um the goal now these days is to educate employees in our, in our customers' offices as to how to spot these phishing emails, how mm -hmm. to spot these this spam, and in order to have everybody aware of what to do, what not to do, what to click on, what to not click on, not right? Click yeah, on, not that's click right. on. Uh, maybe even also based on the company, what their policy may would be, but how to escalate that then to other employees in some fashion so that everyone else is aware of, mm -hmm. okay, hey, we got this that's active and make sure no one else clicks on this too. So we've got, we, we actually have some uh, education service uh, videos that we push out to employees of our clients and helps them identify the phishing emails. Um, Better yet, once we get them started on the training, we can even test them. We can do fire drills. We can send out some fake phishing emails. Oh, wow. Okay. And we can yeah. see who clicks on them, who doesn't. <laughs> Who's yeah. click happy. Yeah. That's right. So, so we did that with a, fir a fairly large accounting firm uh, locally. And the f when we first started working with them with the security uh, awareness training, we had about a 45% 
click through rate on people. Oh, that wow. Clicked on that's the a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this, lot. this was a 60, 70 person accounting firm. Yeah, that's a lot. So we had, we had about 45%. And so what typically happens though, and what happened with them is once we did the training, we start, we've done a cut, we've done a couple of cycles of, of fire drills. It cuts it down to about 3%. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. It's a big difference. So, so what is it, <clears throat> Peter, is it when someone inevitably somebody's going to click on the link, sure. right? Especially the larger the organization, the more likely it is to happen. And I think we've probably all, maybe not you guys, but everyone who's not in your world and maybe perhaps even those who are, um, are gonna get duped by one of these links. And uh, when that happens, are you training their, your client's staff to report it immediately? Does your software catch it immediately and, and create a notification so you can address it? Is it, is it really about catching it as quickly as possible? It's both. Yeah, I was going to say, it's probably a mix of those things. Um, obviously, the the ongoing security awareness training is to make everyone aware of not to click these things, yeah. and this is what they look like, and they're getting more sophisticated. You know, uh, it's not the Egyptian king trying to send you $2 million still, and he just needs your bank account number for it. Um, these so are you people. mean that's not real? So you're saying everybody's I haven't received my out. money. I yeah, know that. Yeah. Um, but it's these are the Nigerian yeah. king. Yeah, Nigeria, yeah. that's these are uh, these are more like you know they're using my email for for example yeah, and leaving right. out one yeah. L in IntelliSystems yeah. or whatever that may be right. Um, so it looks very similar, very close, mm, and yeah. then is someone clicking that? Um, we do have tools on the back end though, however, that can catch some of those things that come through. Um, they might think that they're in a atmosphere and it's really a fake atmosphere and it releases itself. Uh, we do have the foundational security like firewalls, antivirus to hopefully catch some of that stuff, but it's kind of a mixture of everything. And then the, the next process would be if it does get through and let's say it, it grabs their computer, can we shut their computer off from the rest of the network? Mm -hmm. uh, lock that down and then next steps from there are you're looking at backup, you're looking at protocols, what's our policies and procedures uh, for that individual company. Mm -hmm. The majority of the stuff that we've talked about so far, uh, we've been talking about outside of how you really got it started in the foundation, Kevin, that you were able to lay at starting at your kitchen table and moving, <laughs> uh, moving on to, uh, to growth mode, if you will. Uh, but a lot of things that we've talked about so far is we're talking about a, a client that's already on board with you. Like, what are you doing for them? Talk to me about onboarding a client. Like, what does your assessment look like? Uh, I know because that's probably a big deal to come in and understand, like you said it best, Kevin, a minute ago, like, what is it that you're wanting to use the cloud for? Like, how are you working? What does your assessment look like? Uh, Peter, and, and when you talk, when you're talking to a potential or prospective new client. So um, when I'm talking to a prospective client, we're not quite at the assessment okay. phase yet. What okay. I'm trying to determine in a potential client is, are they a good fit for us and are we a good fit for mm -hmm. them? Can we even come in and do exactly what you're asking us to do? You know, uh, some people unfortunately have unrealistic expectations. Some have very realistic. Some don't know of the technology out there that we can help them with. Mm -hmm. um, so it all depends on kind of a, kind of a, a discovery, a discovery phase, yeah. that general conversation of this is what you're looking for. Let's try to help find, you know, your weak points now. And where yeah. are you, you know, experiencing so this downtime? So once you're able to get through that discovery, then you go into an assessment from there? Yes. And then so, what does that look like? So an assessment from there is typically we run scans on servers. We do walkthroughs of the closet, try to get a general we're coming from 30,000 foot view down to 10. Okay. Uh, we're trying to get just a little bit better lay of the land. And then from there, we can take some deep diving tools and, mm -hmm. and really dig into the network to see what do they use? What CRMs are you using? What's your primary software, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. oh, so you go from 30,000 to 10,000 and then all the way to the very granular details Correct. of what's mm -hmm. actually taking place. Correct. E even some of their policy information, you know, what do they okay. have as far as the internet usage policy? Yeah. Uh, what do they have as far as agreements or attestations from their cloud provider as to what the cloud provider is providing and what they agree to do in terms of security? Mm -hmm. um, and that's an area that's a whole other conversation probably, but a lot of times people think, oh, it's in the cloud, so it's secure now. 
and it's it's yeah. just real estate. It's it's somewhere else rather it's than just being not in here, your closet. It's somewhere else, right? And you know the attestation that most of the cloud providers provide is kind of a standardized form. It says here's what we're providing, and here's what we'll do. Here's who you know how we're going to keep people from coming in and fooling with your stuff physically. But beyond that, you know we we're not really doing anything else. And right. if you try to sue us, well, we've got a document that says that. Here's all we're doing. Not to say that cloud providers are bad. They do a good job. Right. And that is really probably eventually where things are going as companies uh, that develop software develop software that runs from a cloud yeah. provider. But it it's a there's a false sense of security sometimes with some customers that think, well, it's in the cloud and it's, so it's secure. Uh, and it's it's just not so. We have a local company that that's a client of ours uh, now. Uh, but at one point, they had all of their stuff in the cloud, and their cloud provider got malware. <laughs> and it affected not only this customers of our stuff, but a bunch of other people's stuff. Yeah. And in fact, this customer of ours now had to loan the cloud provider $75,000 <laughs> to pay the ransomware to get their stuff God. back. Oh, wow. That's fun. Yeah. Mike, we were just talking about kind of a, an assessment and getting a client started. I know that's an area that, that a lot of businesses use when they, they start and engage a, a client, right? Some type of an assessment. That's right. Well, we often, there, there find, we often find where a client is. We look at where they're coming from. So they may have another provider today. And right. so we're able to look at how things have been done to this point. Now, oftentimes uh, it can be damning because we come behind someone and we yeah. we find where they're doing things that maybe aren't best practice. Uh, but sometimes everything's just fine. It's just that maybe the customer doesn't have confidence in right. them further. Yeah, there's but a lot of uh, I think I similarities. You oh, you're good, uh, man. You're, you're good. good. So, yeah. so there's a lot of similarities in our in our worlds because we we walk through a very similar process. We walk through a discovery stage where we're trying to uncover is this client. Uh, a, a good fit for us? Mm -hmm. Do, can we add the value that they need? <clears throat> Do they have expectations that we believe we can meet and exceed? Um, or a timetable that, that's, you know, realistic from our point of view? And what value can we really add to them? But going through that process also allows us to unpack and really get, get clear on where they actually are today, what their knowledge level is, um, how willing they are to embrace things like change in systems. Oh, yeah. Uh, because we know that, that change is inevitable in marketing, especially, and especially with technology. And those two things, you know, work, work really well together today. Well, talk, well talk, maybe we have more in common than you think. Yeah. Because and I know a little bit about advertising, and I know that you have to do it uh, constantly yeah. and regularly, and you have to make a commitment to it. That's right. So it, it's not something where you can just run three or four radio ads and then expect a bunch Double of people to call. And you can't buy a brand new server and throw it in the closet right. and, and connect everyone to it and hope it's going to be good. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah hope exactly. it's going to be secure. There is a certain level of, of commitment that customers have to make, both to your business and to ours. They have to be willing to do the things that we ask them to do. Right. And a lot of that is based around uh, best practices, doing the proper things, training employees, making them aware of the, the ways that they can bring the system down. They really, the end users really are the weak link in the security chain at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So to have them, to, to get the owner's cooperation to help, to help us enforce, do this training employee, Mr. Employee. So, so we know that security is super important for, uh, for an organization. Uh, because it can shut them down completely, could put them out of business, uh, sh short term or you know indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And so, but beyond that, talk a little bit about the advances in technology from the time that you were sitting at that kitchen table and you started this company to where we are today, and how technology is is really helped shape you know the way we conduct business today and, and as we move forward. Uh, some of those changes that you've seen. I that's a gonna, that's I, a good Kevin question because I was only about three or four years old. So. <laughs> I'm not sure the technology that was out at that time. Uh, what technology? Yeah. What technology? <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. Did you have color that's TV hilarious. then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we when we started out, there there was no technology. It was just <laughs> it was workstations and 
network cabling and we could connect them and sometimes uh, we could make the wires connect the computers together <laughs> no i'm kidding about the sometimes um you know back in those days it was basically a server and client or server mm -hmm. workstation environment very local yes mm -hmm. and if you needed to access the internet which al gore invented about 93 or 94 <laughs> or something like that i'm just kidding about it's his that. claim anyway yeah, that's what he said um it has been joked about many times since. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if you wanted to access Internet, there was always AOL or CompuServe that you could dial up. Yeah. Um, and it, everything mostly that. was dial up. I mean, that's everything when we started. That's what we had. So I still remember, though, uh, late in the 90s, we, we actually got a provider to bring in an ISDN Internet line, which is a digital trunk line. And we... At, got one of our better customers to get one as well and believe it or not the most amazing thing ever was that we could actually send emails to each other and they appeared real time <laughs> that was amazing in 1997 so um but it, it, and it's hard to even fathom that isn't it like it today is. i mean you're you don't even feel like that never that did not exist, right? It's like, it's like, how people did, thought yeah. that Google was always here. Right. But I remember the day the attorney we worked with, it was a friend of mine, like 1999, 2000. I remember him saying, check this out. It's called Google. <laughs> and I had never, you know, we'd never <laughs> seen that before. I mean, if you wanted to search before then, you went to, to uh, CompuServe or, or um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, I can't remember. The name I have no idea. It, no. Yeah. But anyway, you, uh, come on, Peter. You don't you always ask Jeeves. I was about to say I do ask remember Jeeves, an ask Jeeves. Yes, ask yeah. Jeeves. I remember that. Ask Jeeves. Um, but anyway, it, it progressed. Uh, you know, one thing that happened that kind of got and forgot, kind of got forgotten in that time frame was the Telecommunications Act of 1996 uh, made it so that AT and T had competitors at that point mm. to deliver bandwidth and uh, phone lines to. Uh, individual customers, both residential and business. Now, the residential customers nobody wanted because those they don't make any money on those. But the uh, the business customers was a big deal, and so you started seeing a lot of competitors pop up in the 1998 1999 time frame. And the reason I bring this up is because we started to see the price for fairly fast bandwidth at the time, like a T1, for instance, which was one and a half megabit. You probably have 200 at your home now um that's something but a, a megabit and a half but it was always on it wasn't a dial-up and uh, um, and it became a lot less expensive it also coincided with a time frame where phone systems began to change we looked at uh you know the idea of voip phones has been around for a while voice over ip uh it was it kind of got started then when we started seeing um, pervasive uh, I, uh, bandwidth delivery like like the T1s and such. But the dot-com crash in 2000 kind of postponed it for a few years. So we, as a company, we learned how to install old-fashioned phone systems. We became an NEC dealer okay. and started putting yeah. in old-fashioned old phone systems, mm -hmm. business phone systems. and um, we even were a, uh, a subcontractor for a competitor at AT&T locally and started uh, doing cutovers for them to turn service on for customers that wanted their service and needed to connect up phones to the service and get internet bandwidth. And so we cut our teeth on all of that in the early 2000s. But we saw eventually that the VoIP thing would happen. We'd start to see uh, companies that wanted to just plug the phone into the wall, the same connection that the computer plugs into, and it work. So, in effect, that's where we are today. That even the big names in the business, Avaya, which is uh, an, a derivative of what used to be AT and T back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, Avaya is what's left of AT and T's phone business from years ago. And even now, they're embracing the whole VoIP cloud phone product uh, so we're, that's really where we're spending a lot of our activity now is installing you know as far as vo phone systems at least we're spending uh, our time installing VoIP phones and what's great about it is that we can do the things like you've seen so pervasively now with zoom mm -hmm. with COVID-19 now and people needing to be able to have the audio conference video conference 
You can do that with your phone extension, with apps that run on your computer, your laptop, your mobile phone. But it's also, you got a desk phone on your desk that you can call in the traditional way. You know but, what's so funny about that, Kevin, is, uh, yep. is I remember in college, uh, Mike, I, I would go down to, if, if you're listening to us on podcast, we were here in South Carolina, and uh, I would go down to the Heritage Golf Tournament, PGA Golf Tournament down in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Years I've been, I've been going for years and years and years. And so back then, uh, it was the MCI Heritage Golf yeah. Tournament. And so MCI was a, a sponsor. And so we couldn't wait to get over to number 15 green because they had a big MCI tent. And this was well before cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. And we got, to we got to call a free long distance phone call from the <laughs> MCI tent. We literally would wait in line, get in the tent and make a free telephone call, a long distance telephone call. And, all, and p everybody would flock to this tent. We would stop doing what we were doing, paying you know hundreds of dollars to get down there and thousands of dollars to stay down there in Hilton Head in order to go make a free long distance phone call in this tent at this golf tournament. It was almost comical, you know, because Mike and I have been, we kind of started Splash with uh, a voice over IP. And, and I remember Mike, because you were the one that kind of landed on that. I was like, hey, let's go buy a phone system right. and hang it on the wall and get it all wired. And I was like, we're broke, Matt. We can't yeah, do Mike that. Yeah, Mike was like, no, you know how expensive <laughs> those things are? Let's buy a phone and just plug it into yeah. the day. And I was like, well, how's that going to work? Right? And so, uh, and so, and, and you actually landed there a lot, lot sooner than, than I did. But I was always wondering, where did voice over IP start to fall into the IT world and out of like the phone company world? And I guess that's when it happened, right? It's when it started being data-driven versus, I, I guess, non-data driven. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's true. Did yeah. you want to comment something to yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the way it ties in now is productivity for the most part. Okay. Um, it's uptime reliability. Um, a traditional phone system where you have a PBX or a, um, sorry, I don't mean to use like terms, but yeah. a phone server, yeah. right, in your own closet, you're hosting it. That's a buzzword and, alert. Uh, yeah, sorry. Buzzword. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so when you have your own phone server, you lose power, you lose your phones. You lose your internet where those pot lines or analog lines or whatever those uh, PRIs coming in, you lose your phones as well. And those systems are older, traditional, it's only phones. Um, so now with the new VoIP, uh, it's hosted in the cloud, so it's not in your atmosphere anymore. You just need some sort of connection. The main connection is, yes, typically internet. Uh, but the nice thing now, at least with, with our phones, is if you lose internet or even power to your building, um, you have cellular backup now. So my cell phone connects to my office phone and I can make calls from it, receive calls, whatever. No one knows I'm actually on my cell phone. Yeah, I've got an app right here on my phone. I, I can it's dial, awesome. it looks like, like I'm dialing from my From office. your office. Mm -hmm. You know what's awesome cool. about that is you look at What's happened this year, and, and a very popular word term has been pivot, right? And so, yes. So those businesses that pivot have- and pitch. That's right. Pivot and pitch. And so when you pivoted this year, when companies pivoted, that those who are using voice over IP and leveraging technology, people working mm -hmm. with folks like your, like your organization, uh, hopefully we're in position to pivot a little easier mm -hmm. and continue to uh, learn a new way of business as usual where they could be mobile, uh, working remotely, and still answer the telephone, where yes. they could still access uh, fi important files uh, in a secure way. Talk to, to us a little bit. Is there like a success story this year or one that, that you just love to share uh, about a client that I know personally, just one that I uh, that I sold personally was um, this was a new client, not an internal managed client where in the sense of we do their IT and cybersecurity. Um, this was actually just a client that is probably not a good fit for that portion of our business, but um, they do have the phone system that they needed and um, they needed the flexibility of being able to work remotely and at home. Um, and so being able to install that uh, every single employee could be 
at their home, at their, you know, wherever. Using uh, their normal office number. Correct. And using their normal office number. You still can track those calls coming in. We can still pull reports from that. But even bigger was transitioning from an older system where they're paying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month um, to, you know, a traditional internet provider for these lines. Um, we were able to eliminate all that. They bought a brand new system from us. Um, so they get all the nice features we just discussed, but they also now are, are saving three or four hundred dollars mm, a month. It's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're paying them to take it. <laughs> we we did something similar for the actually for the Columbia Chamber. Uh, okay. Locally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, y'all are partners with the Columbia Chamber. Mm -hmm. We are. They've we been are. on our show multiple times. They're really good people. Oh yeah, we've worked with them for a number of years, and, and very good people. Uh, they were unfortunate and un unfortunately moving their office right as COVID hit. That's right. Mm -hmm. So they moved in, I think it was late April. And so in the process, we not only had to help them get set up with the new phones, but then also it turned out it helped them get set up so they could work from work home because they started working from home for yep. two months after that, mm -hmm. I think. Yep. And so that was really fortunate. Uh, and they mirrored a lot of other uh, customers of ours where we helped them you know, some cases they bought laptops or maybe they had existing laptops. We had to help them get off site where they could work remotely uh, with the data. Uh, but also, like in this case with the phones, we were able to help them get up and running with phones, whether it was a, a handset that sat on someone's kitchen table at home or maybe it's an app on their cell phone, yeah. but they were able to work remotely. And that was a great success story, I think, because they, they were able to continue working and and we spent a lot of time doing that for clients in March and April, uh, just mm -hmm. getting them where they could work outside of the office. Um, just talking to our, our viewers and our listeners here, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of voiceover in comparison to non, non VoIP type phones? So traditionally, uh, an on-premise phone system requires um, analog lines or POTS lines from an actual internet provider. Okay. Um, so Sagra, Spectrum, someone like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, those can get expensive, um, but it's not just a phone system. So you do get to eliminate those uh, and, and now you are connected over the internet mm -hmm. or even cellular. Um, so the reliability and the connection there of having failovers, you technically never you know, okay. you're not going down, you have a phone system. Right. But on top of that, you get to stack in additional software. So um, with our phone system, um, I call it AIM, just because that's, we grew up AIMing each other. Yeah. But, um, you know, you have a team style chat, you know, mm -hmm. where you can still communicate with your entire uh, team. And it's encrypted. Um, you have the kind of go to meeting where I can now host a conference calls. So you're not purchasing that outside of your phone system. Okay. Um, it even has file storage within its own system. So uh, sort of the Dropbox type capability. Okay. It's, so, yes, really nice. very similar. So it's combining a lot of different things and putting it all into one price per month, um, which is just it's very convenient. You know, the hardware is free. It's included. Um, okay. And you get new phones every three years i think mm -hmm. so 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 the benefit is that you're in effect you're moving that dusty box that's in the closet uh, that runs the phones in your office mm -hmm. that's moving to the cloud somewhere mm -hmm. and instead of having just one box that can get hit by lightning or that can the fan can quit running in it and it overheats and dies now you've got the back ends in a data center somewhere and it's redundantly backed up. So one data center's down, the other one in Colorado keeps it running, for instance. So um, with multiple redundancies as far as how that, that your, your cloud server, so to speak, makes it back out to the internet. But again, like Peter was saying, <clears throat> you pay for a single internet connection to the office that supports the internet for computers, data, but also for your phone and phone service. So you don't pay for expensive individual lines or in individual uh, PRI or some other type of service now in order to deliver to traditional phone systems. So it ends up in a lot of cases being a cost savings. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked a little bit about stacking some of these, some of these technologies are stacked together and packaged in one price. Yep. And we talk about that a lot here as well. It, it, you know, it's Splash Omnimedia in our, in our business. And uh, we know that uh, when you can do that, it, it, it creates more efficiency. They don't have to learn 
15 different tools. Um, they got one centralized place they can go and, and accomplish a lot of things. People are being asked today, employees are being asked, uh, you know, no matter what the industry, to produce more uh, in the same amount of time. And so they're looking at technology, uh, you know, in particular f to help them accomplish that. What are you seeing? What's the most exciting thing you see on the horizon uh, or, or is bleeding edge that people are starting to integrate that's helping them accomplish more uh, with the same amount of time or less? I'll throw one thing out there, and it's this is along the lines of VoIP phones again. I know we spent a lot of time on that now, but when I talk to customers, one thing we always are cognizant of, and you, you guys probably are too, you want customers to have the best experience possible. And that's really how we separate ourselves from everybody else out there. And so <clears throat> if I have, um, you know, if I'm a doctor's office, and pick on the doctors a little bit, um, if I'm a doctor's office and I have patients that are calling in, it's kind of notorious with a lot of doctor's offices that you stay on hold for a while. Uh, sometimes it takes a while to get someone on the phone that can act actually help you because they're busy. And with mm -hmm. the healthcare, at, such it is, as it is, um, it's difficult for them to pay bunches of people to be able to handle phone calls and so on and so forth. So one thing that I think that's really special now is with the VoIP technology. In the old days, if you wanted call center type features, where, and I know I say call center immediately, people shut down and they say, I'm only, I only have 10 people at my company. We don't need a call center, but really you do. I mean, even, even if it's just a person or two that handles calls, ideally you wanna know what happens with every customer. Mm -hmm. And as you, know, you guys are advertising and, and marketing people you know, you can do all the things that you guys do and get people to the doorstep but if the customer is not willing to open the door <laughs> or answer the phone, you, you, yeah. your, <laughs> whole, your whole credibility is shot and your ability to have the customer realize the benefits you guys provide gets shot. Yep. And the same way with our phones. I mean, I get I can't tell you how many times in the old days with older phone systems, I used to get calls from like a car dealer or some business and they'd say yeah yeah customers are calling complaining because they can't get through nobody's answering the phone or the phone's not ringing and so we'd call and we'd do tests and it was calling just nobody was answering i mean this is a personnel problem this is not a technology problem yeah so having the ability to to see what happens kind of cradle mm -hmm. to grave with a with a call with a mm -hmm. customer basically that wants to do business with you is really important and having call center type services and the ability to do that very inexpensively now with cloud-based VoIP phones. Right. I love the awesome. ability. Love the ability and even the thought of being able to measure the results of something someone's purchased and spent money on. You know, did they hang up? Did they give up and fall off a hold or did they get transferred five times? You could you can see all kinds you of get stuff, visibility right? into what happened yep. when customers call. And that's important. You're listening to The Brainstorm with Matt and Mike uh, today on our show. We have IntelliSystems, and we're really just talking about infrastructure, cybersecurity, information technology. And we just finished a conversation on how important uh, telecommunications is. And not just how important it is, but how you actually can do all kinds of really cool stuff today, Mike, with measurement of, of the effectiveness of mm -hmm. some of the things that we offer from a marketing strategy perspective and advertising. I mean, we don't want to spend money driving people to an organization who can't take the call. Yeah, that stinks. Or does it get the email yeah. or mm -hmm. something that the automatic, automated response gets kicked back to the prospective client uh, because something is down internally. And so it all kind of rolls together. So as we kind of go through, uh, you know, the rest of 2020 here and into 2021, um, you know, you look at uh, Mike and I do this all the time from from what we do from a marketing strategy perspective. We're looking at what really differentiates clients, what differentiates organizations. So what really different differentiates you guys from other, you know, so-called IT outsourced vendors, if you would? Well. I'll go back to it again. I think it's the unique process that we have to discover what a customer is attempting to do. What it, where are they having problems now? What's wrong with what you've got? Okay. Mm -hmm. So is it because you've spent a lot of money on equipment and software 
but you aren't able to use it effectively? Or, or do you have a cloud-based product, but it, it goes down all the time? Um, I, I mean, there's a variety of different things. Maybe you've been hacked a couple of times, and so you've had to pay ransomware, and you don't understand why you're getting these problems when you know your next door neighbor uh, business yeah. doesn't have these problems. Um, so, you know, our goal is to discover, to understand what you're trying to do with your technology. And um, so I think our, un our unique approach to that is what makes us special in one regard. Um, I, I think another piece of it might would be that under one roof, we've got people that wear a lot of different hats, individuals that wear a single hat, but collectively lots of hats. Mm -hmm. So if you need someone that is good with understanding how we need to lay out the APs for a Wi-Fi network, well, we've got people that can do that. Uh, if we need to, if you're moving to a new building and we need to set up a reliable cabling infrastructure, we've got people that do that day in and day out. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, if we if we want to come in and meet with you quarterly or biannually or annually even, if that's all you really want us to do, we've got people that can come in and they understand not just the technology, but overall how, you know, workflow through your office right. should work. And if you want to, you know, Peter mentioned CRM a few months ago, people always want to understand how to handle their customers better. So we may would make some recommends as far as a CRM product mm -hmm. and then help them through the decision-making process to pick a product that works best for them. Yeah, because you understand their infrastructure and right. what their needs are. <clears throat> so for us, we find that we can do a, for most organizations, we can do a great job in the initial phases of the relationship, but really where we add the most value is in that ongoing relationship. And the further we are on that journey, the more we understand who the customer is, uh, what their where their blind spots are, where they're really strong, and we're able to add uh, considerably more value, you know, six months, a year, two years down the road than we did day one. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine that it's a it's similar, similar process for you. And so you walk through this process, this discovery, uh, is what we've been calling it today. Um, and, and then you go through and do an assessment, an evaluation to see kind of what the I guess the, the technolo technology health, the technological health of the organization is, what happens a year, two years down the road? Because we see things changing rapidly in our own business. What are you seeing? Are you going back and reassessing? Is there a- Well, what we commonly see is uh, a, lot of, a lot of smaller companies that, com that compete with us in, to some degree in one area or another. They might have one, two, three, five people working there, and they, each one of them wears a lot of hats. So what we find is that they, they really only respond when you have a problem. Mm. And they're always reactively responding. Um, now, you may be able to sit down with them occasionally and, and, and try to get some ideas on what, where we want to go next. And there's a lot of good providers out there. I'm not trying to, to talk them but down. But even in that case, they're but probably reactively responding to exactly. your, want, your desire to sit down with them, right? Well, it's just, I'm, I'm, I can say it because I've been there right. 27 years ago. You can only do so much in a day. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, once you get behind the eight ball, then it, <laughs> you stay behind yeah. the eight ball. Yeah. So you're, you're typically reactive. And so what, what I think that it's useful to say in our business is that we're able to, we have people that that's what their goal is, is to get in front of the ball, to get out in front, lead with as far as how decisions should happen uh, for technology. And uh, well, I mean, we've run into where we've picked up new customers in the past situations where like last year, where we had a technology refresh where people had to get rid of their Windows 7 computers mm -hmm. and their current provider at the time came to them in October and said, hey, Windows 7 is going to expire in January. You need to buy 30 new computers. <laughs> you have a month to do it. Yeah, and you got you know, well, three months to do it. And the That's the difference between proactive and reactive. Right? Wow. Yeah, the customer was like, well, what? I, why didn't you tell me this a year ago right. or two so, years ago? I, so I could be budgeting and we could be transitioning out over a course of time. So one thing, and I, I hate to characterize our VCIOs as trying to sell stuff because that's not really their job. 
But they, one of the things they do is to try to keep an eye on, okay, how old is this server? How old is this workstation? If you want to set up a schedule where we can replace, say, half a dozen of them a year, well, let's plan that and make mm -hmm. sure that it happens. Mm -hmm. That way you've got a rotation of relatively new computers and equipment at all times. Maybe it's a firewall. You, we probably need to keep an eye on a firewall every five years or so. We'll look at, do we need to replace it? Uh, so that's probably an area that is a big differentiator for us is that we're not in crisis mode. We have people that well, that's a, I think that's a big differentiator, don't you, Mike? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also have, um, and, and it's separate from the VCIO roles as well. You know, we have account managers, VCIOs, but we also have technical alignment managers or what we call TAMs. And these are all different people, different departments. Um, someone like that is is meeting with a business owner on a quarterly basis mm -hmm. um, and just saying, hey, you know, where are we going in the next year? So very proactive. Very. Um, you know, it's it's sitting down and, and, you know, Matt, Mike, what's your three-year goal? How are we going to help you get there with technology? Mm -hmm. Do you have the right infrastructure now to even get there? I want to open a new office here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that person's job is just to have those conversations, line those up with standard practices, yeah. and then we can help you grow as well. Yeah. That makes perfect sense to me. I know one of the earlier conversations we were talking about, uh, you guys were talking about really just battling awareness, like keeping, uh, making sure people understand the need for cybersecurity and the need for, uh, especially kind of almost like an unbiased, really, I'd say unbiased just because you're not in the weeds of a business, mm -hmm. uh, but really you're biased because you're passionate about making sure their business is uptime, is, 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 uh, is secure and making sure that they're operating in, in the peak efficiency. So it's kind of an unbiased slash bias approach. Uh, but really, I know that um, uh, that you guys talked about just battling awareness. So talk to me just uh, briefly just about what you feel the market is from a business executive understanding of the need of these services that you guys offer. Well, I think and I'll, I'll say a little something about it and then you can, sure. if you want to add to it. But I think that uh, the, uh, the, the thing that we see most often is um, a lot of smaller companies, say 5, 10, 15, 20, or even 50 employee companies, they have trouble believing that the Russians are out to get them. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's so far off their radar. It is. And they figure, well, you know, Target's the one that gets hit by that, or Walmart, or mm -hmm. these big companies. That's who they want to get, because they got a bunch of money. And the reality is, is that every business is just an IP address on the internet. So, you, I mean, it's like, box, like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... What we what's happened in the last number of years is every business can be an opportunity for a thief, and some in some cases it is Chinese or Russian, you know, state actors. But most often it is actual entrepreneurs that are sitting somewhere trying to figure out how I can make a bunch of money, literally. And so if I can if I can fish email into your business and get you to go buy a couple of Apple iCards down the road, uh, iTunes cards, and send me the money for those, which is easy to do and happens all the time, then I can make a thousand or ten thousand dollars here today. And even in this country, ten thousand dollars a week is a good living. Uh, but if you're in Russia or Iran or some other maybe I wouldn't say third world, but maybe lower standard of living area in the world, it's a lot of money. And so it is a business. It's yeah. not like what you think it's the hooded kid sitting in the basement of his mom's <laughs> house. This is yeah. a business and there are people that are attacking everyone just to see who's got the, the doors unlocked mm. in the mall parking lot. It's funny that you said that, Mike, the other day, uh, one of our team members came to me and said, 
did you just email me and ask me to go buy an Apple's iTunes gift card? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what happened. And it came from me. It came from Matt at Splash Shawnee yeah. Media to another one of our team members says, yep. hey, you got a minute, question mark. Can you run down and buy an Apple iTunes gift card? Yep. And I thought to myself, now, what would a spammer or a hacker get from me telling someone to go buy? I didn't say go buy it from them. I mean, I was like, I, I didn't know. Yeah, they typically then will try to ask you to, once you've purchased that, scratch off the back, read me those numbers. And uh, then they get to go and buy a bunch of stuff off iTunes. And especially now with people working more remotely, Correct. it's probably gotcha. that much Absolutely. more prevalent. It, yeah, that makes sense. It's, you know, it's, uh, Mike's asking me to go grab this gift card for a client, and he's busy, tied up. He can't do it today, and he knows that I have time. Right. Yeah, the exact thing that I saw happen to a company um, locally is the secretary is working and yeah, poor lady. a boss if she gets an email from what looks like her boss just yeah, like what yeah. you're talking about matt and so the email says hey i need to get a couple of itunes gift cards for a couple of customers um, that i'm going to meet with this afternoon but i'm about to go in a meeting so you won't be able to reach me i need you to go out and get those you probably will have to go to more than one place to get them because there's a limit on how much you can buy at one place <laughs> They told him exactly what they were going to encounter. No deal. So the secretary runs out, goes to two different Walgreens and picks up yeah. iTunes, uh, iTunes gift cards. Comes back, has them ready, packaged up there for the owner or the business manager to, to come back by and pick them up. Well, she gets another email from him. Turns out I'm not going to be able to get by there. Can you just scratch off the numbers on the back and tell me what, the, or scratch off the back, tell me what the numbers are on the back? and I will just uh, forward the credit to them. They did, or she did, and they took the money for the gift cards. So, wow. And from a marketer's perspective, I, the technology, the, <laughs> the marketing tech we use, all of that could be automated. I mean, yes. so they could literally program that if this happens and this oh, is yeah. the response, if they respond this, then yeah. shotgun them off. So just they could send that out to thousands of people. Take a photograph of, of the back of the card minute. with the number scratched yep. off. That's all I need. Yeah. God. I think that was, they got, and uh, the worst part is when she did it, they sent another email and told her to do it again, and she did in the same day. <laughs> and I think it was like four grand. Okay. Something Holy like God. that. Wow. That's a lot of IT. Yeah, I feel bad for so her. So that, that's the yeah. social aspect of it. There is a what's called uh, social engineering, and um, and that's what it revolves around. You don't want to you don't want to let your boss down. Yeah, you're trying to do the right thing right. and take care of a customer. Uh, but it turns out that it's it's a very uh, unique way of fishing. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if folks that are listening and, uh, and watching our show today, um, whether radio or later on a podcast or, uh, or one of our social videos that we put out, if they want to get a hold to you and ask you any follow-up questions or maybe even engage your company to do a discovery, what's the best way for them to go about doing that? Well, they can reach uh, uh, Peter directly, Peter at Intellis, uh, IntelliSystems.com. Peter F. Peter F. Sorry. Peter Otherwise, F you'll get the other Peter. Yeah, you'll get yeah, the other Peter. Peter F. at IntelliSystems.com. Okay. Yep. Or, um, or go to our website, IntelliSystems.com. We have some things on there where you can kind of go and fill in your information. Yep. And we can contact you when it's convenient. Yep. Um, call us. Yep. Uh, we're 803-563-6363. Um, so All in right, fact, pretty, if you call there, you'll homework. probably, if you hit the sales button when you call in, you'll probably get Christian. Uh, okay. Yep. And she can, she can direct you as direct well. Direct you from there. Well, guys, we really appreciate you joining us today on the show. We look forward to further conversations with you guys. And I'm sure that some of our listeners and viewers will definitely want to reach out to you as well. We definitely encourage everybody that's listening to you in our show today to make sure that your business and organization and data uh, is secure. I know Mike and I have talked about this quite often over the past decade or uh, multiple decades. Uh, I know Mike and I look very, very young, but believe it or not, we've, uh, we're much older than we look. Uh, our haircuts. Will Speak do, for yourself, we, man. We, we just keep our haircuts cut low like this. And we're not really bald. <laughs> You're listening to The Brainstorm with Matt and Mike. We really appreciate you joining us. You can go to thebrainstormradio.com, subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or you can catch us live on the radio on Monday mornings from 9A to 10A on The Point. Again, we really appreciate you joining us. On behalf of Mike, my business partner, myself, Kevin and Peter from Intellisystems, thank you guys very much. Thank you. 
We'll catch you next time. Thank you. On the brainstorm with Matt and Mike.